All right, welcome back, and how the bloody hell are you? Uh, let's go ahead and continue. This is part two of oscillators, and uh, we're going to go ahead and continue with the basic twin T oscillator, which again we mentioned before combines low pass, high pass filter, and it forms a notch filter. We've discussed how this works uh, with other um, uh, filter circuits. We do that here. And we do this at that oscillation frequency, whatever the oscillation frequency we design. Am I recording? I am recording. Okay. All right. And it says excellent notch filter can be formed by using R's and C's related by a factor of two as shown here. So we have um, low pass or we have the T. Let me give you my, where's my laser pointer? There we go. So we have these two T's. And then we have this T here, one with two resistors and a capacitor. Well, with two capacitors and a resistor, <clears throat> where R and R is equal to this R, uh, and this capacitance is equal to this capacitance here, but two times whatever capacitance that is. Let's go to this one. All right, so the twin T oscillator. It's a specific type of oscillator. It's primarily used to generate sine waves, sine signals. It's called a twin T because it has that two twin T shape of uh, the filter network, the two R's and one T and the two C's and one R. And uh, the networks are, again, are just composed of capacitors and resistors in that arrangement. Um, let's talk about it as it relates to the factors of an oscillator. So when we're looking at the twin T oscillator uh, with respect to the feedback network portion, um, again, it, it just consists of the two T-shaped filter networks each T network uh, comprises uh, uh, two resistors and two capacitors, and they're arranged in that T configuration. The junction of the two resistors forms the output of the node, while the junction of the two capacitors forms the uh, connects to the input of the node. When we're talking about frequency determination with the twin T, uh, the values of the resistors and capacitors, again, that make up the T network will determine the oscillation frequency of the circuit. So by um, selecting the values of these components, the oscillator frequency can be selected to any desired value within physical, uh, uh, within specs of, of the operational amplifier, of course. Uh, when we're discussing phase shifting with twin T, so the twin T network produces a phase shift of 180 degrees at the oscillation frequency, and this phase shift uh, combined with the phase shift introduced by the amplifier that results in a total of 360 degrees and so that satisfies the condition for that sustained oscillation of having that positive feedback. When we discuss the amplification factor for twin T, uh, so the amplification stage, uh, in this case we're using an op amp, it's used uh, when it's used with this twin T oscillation circuit, the um, it's used to provide gain and it's used to compensate for the losses in the feedback network, which is pretty much what every amplifier gain portion of the oscillator circuits that we've discussed do. Okay. So stability and tuning, right? So we have these components that we can actually, excuse me, um, we can uh, decide which frequency we're going to be uh, oscillating it and notching. So when we discuss stability and tuning, again, you pick the right components that um, are essential to make sure you have that um, um, reliable operation of these twin T oscillators. And again, fine tuning by, uh, of this oscillator involves just adjusting the resistors of the capacitors uh, within the T network. So very basic. Um, yeah, basic um, RC uh, calculations. The output, the sine wave output. So for the twin T oscillator, it's known for its ability to generate uh, relatively pure sine wave signals, very little distortion. Again, uh, this makes this particular um, oscillator um, very good for applications that require high quality sinusoidal signals. So again, I can't guarantee that this is something you'll see in a, in a something like a medical device or something in aerospace, but where wherever you need um, uh, 
sinusoidal signals generated uh, with very low distortion, very reliable. This is a good circuit. Uh, applications for the Twin T, uh, you're going to find this in audio signal generation, uh, any place you do frequency synthesis, instrumentation, uh, waveform generators, uh, and waveform generators for testing measurement purposes. So the, the, the waveform generators that are used to create the standard for you to calibrate another device, something like that for the um, accuracy and the stability of the waveform is critical because it's going to be used as a, as a standard for something else. I'm always off the camera. There you go. And again, so the Twin T oscillator provides, uh, again, a very simple, effective, um, stable sine wave generator. And this makes it a very good tool for electronics, specifically communications engineering. What else do we got? Improvements to the basic circuit shown in this diagram. You can add parallel diodes which and R6. So we have the parallel diodes here and R6 here on the feedback. This significantly reduces distortion by attenuating harmonics. And then the potentiometer adds output amplitude adjustment. Where's my potentiometers? Right here. Right. Now, we've talked about the uh, using potentiometers. For, for gain. And while this is fine, if you're going to be manually adjusting something, um, when you're dealing with even audio signals, which are, are very, very fast, where you can't adjust and compensate properly, you'd want some kind of automatic gain control. Right. So it says here, the frequency is a little higher than the predicted value. Looks like we did a calculation. The frequency is a little higher than the predicted value of 1.94 kilohertz with plus or minus 15 volt power supply. So we have plus or minus 15 volts applied to the uh, 741 Charlie uh, operation um, op amp. Uh, Since so the measured values are F is equal to 2.28 kilohertz at two volts peak to peak with an amplitude of amplitude equal to zero to 27 volts uh, peak to peak. So that's the output. This makes it sound like we had done a calculation prior to this. I must be missing a slide. All right, Copet's oscillators. Okay, Copet oscillator, uh, you can see here, now we're moving into inductors and capacitors. So this is a popular LC oscillator, it is the Copet's, uses two series capacitors in the resonant circuit, and the feedback voltage is developed across C1. So the Copet's oscillator, it's uh, LC or inductor capacitor oscillator, and it produces sinusoidal uh, output signals at radio frequencies. Uh, again, it's just named uh, after Edwin Culpitz, um, the inventor, the discoverer of the oscillator. Uh, so this oscillator is known for, again, if you look at it, it's simplicity and wide uh, frequency range. So how does it work? We've talked about tank circuits before, and that's what this is, basically, uh, a tank circuit. The tank circuit is the two capacitors, C1 and T C2, with the inductor. And these just form uh, a resonant LC circuit that determines the oscillation frequency of, of that circuit. And you calculate the, the resonant frequency just the way we did in previous classes. So this is what you did in previous classes. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you haven't had any of my classes, you probably should have had a class like that before you listen to this lecture. Uh, the feedback network portion of the oscillator and how this is relevant. So the tank circuit here, it serves as a feedback network for the oscillator. And then so you get a portion of that output voltage from the tank circuit is fed back to the input of the amplifier. And uh, it's usually an active device like a transistor or an operation mm -hmm. amplifier is shown here. Uh, and that goes through a voltage divider network formed by uh, C1 and C2 as we see here in the diagram. Now, obviously, we always have an amplification factor in oscillators uh, on amplification block diagram or an, op an operate, uh, amplification uh, functional diagram uh, of the process. And again, this is because we need that feedback signal uh, compensated for the loss that it's in experiencing in, in the tank circuit and some of the other components. Uh, and then uh, that gets fed back to uh, the amplified signal gets fed back to the tank circuit 
and it does that so that you can actually sustain oscillations. Right. I sound like I'm repeating myself, and I am, um, so that you won't forget these oscillation components. Uh, when determining the frequency, so the oscillation frequency of a Culpitz oscillator, you determine it by the values, again, of the capacitors, C1 and C2, and the inductor in that tank circuit. So uh, there's a formula for the oscillation. We'll cover that in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, but we can adjust the values of C1, C2, or L, or the inductor, and we can use that to tune the oscillator to, I hate to say like whatever frequency we want, but uh, whatever frequency within the operating limits of this particular uh, op amp. Because op amps we know do not have infinite bandwidth. Theoretically, they do, but practically, they don't. Um, what happens at startup? Uh, like the other oscillators, when you power this um, this circuit, obviously the, the oscillator is turned on, but again, you're not going to get any oscillation. You do this in simulation, you're probably not going to get anything. The in, in the simulation circuit, you're probably going to have to add a, a, an extra component that's just going to act as the agitator. So uh, in real life, you're going to have something. You're going to have noise, some kind of disturbance, uh, anything that initiates the oscillation and the circuit's gonna just start oscillating until it goes into its stable oscillation mode. Biasing, so uh, in a transistor-based culpits versus like the op amp, you have to properly bias the transistor. And again, that's crucial for that stable operation. It's much easier to use a, an op amp chip, an IC op amp. Uh, but if you're gonna build this from scratch and using uh, transistors again you just have to build it and bias it so that the transistor remains in the um, in the active region and that it provides that necessary gain for the oscillation and where do you find these where do you find a culpitz oscillator um, it's used in uh, rf applications so wireless communication radio transmitters um, uh, local oscillators and receivers, and, and again, signal generators that we mentioned uh, earlier with, uh, not test devices, that was a previous one. Um, yeah, signal generators. They're also used, you can use them in um, frequency synthesizers, test equipment, scientific instruments, and so forth. I don't know, I keep shifting my camera over here. But overall, the, uh, this, the Culpitz oscillator, it's a Another popular choice, look at it, it's very simple to, to build, very simple to calculate the and design, uh, and it's got a wide variety of applications. All right, and here is uh, the resonant frequency formula, which I mentioned prior to this slide. The resonant frequency is equal to 1 over 2 pi times the square root of L times CT, the total capacitance. Um, and it says when you have Q greater than 10, the quality, the formula gives good results. So, so recall total capacitance of two series capacitors in the product over sum of the individual capacitors. Therefore, we have the resonant frequency equal to, if you want me to read that whole thing, I won't. I just won't. But it's there. Right there. Let me read there. If you have a Q less than 10, a quality factor less than 10, uh, a correction for Q is as follows. Um, again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But this is our correction factor, Q squared uh, over Q squared plus 1, all that square rooted. Mm. Hartley oscillator. Uh, very similar, right? Kind of looks similar to the Culpitz oscillator, but it's kind of reversing components. Uh, says you have two series inductors uh, and a single tapped in uh, two series inductors or a single tapped inductor and a parallel capacitor. And it says when the frequency for when you want a quality factor greater than 10, it's going to be 1 over 2 pi times the square root of L1 plus L2 times C. <clears throat> and an advantage of the Hartley oscillator is that it can be tuned by using a variable capacitor in the resonant circuit. So you can use the this capacitor here uh, as a variable cap um, again this is just another variation of the lc oscillator 
Uh, this one gets its name from Ralph Hartley. I keep wanting to say Hartley. Um, again, it also offers simplicity uh, as we saw the other oscillating circuits, oscillators, the oscillators. Um, and we commonly see this in uh, radio frequency applications. So how does this one work? It's like the culprits. It has a tank circuit. So um, the tank circuit, you know, right, composed of uh, those two inductors and the capacitor, um, or again, uh, an inductor that's center tapped, <clears throat> um, use those components to determine the resonant frequency. The feedback network, again, is going through this feedback network, this tank. <clears throat> a portion that's, again, of the same output goes through the tank circuit, the tank circuit, uh, oh, which is also amplified, right? So a portion of the output, which is amplified, goes to that tank circuit. Um, it goes through the inductor. Um, and the inductor acts like a voltage divider, and it provides also a, a necessary phase shift to give you the uh, um, that positive feedback that we're looking for in oscillation, oscillators. Right. What else? The amplification stage. So... Uh, Again, repeating myself, but hopefully it sticks to you, it sticks in your head. We need the amplification stage, oh, I repeat this over and over, to compensate for losses, in this case, the tank circuit with the two inductors and a capacitor, or a single center tap inductor in parallel with the capacitor. Um, so we're gonna have losses there, we're gonna have losses in, in, in other various components until the amplification is, is used to compensate for that so that we can continue to get uh, feedback of the right phase shift plus the right amplitude to continue the um, oscillations, sustain oscillations, we say. Um, determining the frequency, we'll talk about the formulas to determine the actual frequency in the next few slides. Um, startup, just like uh, every other oscillator, this is going to require some kind of initial, we say, disturbance or some kind of noise or some kind of start oscillation to get the thing going. But once it once it goes, it keeps on going as long as you have power to the uh, the amplification circuit, and it moves into a, a stable um, oscillation mode, and it just stays like that as long as you got power. <clears throat> if um, I mentioned again, if you're doing this in simulation, you're going to have to create a circuit to provide the initial disturbance. Um, that's it. I won't talk about biasing. We'll just stay with the IC chip. But again, if you had, a, if you're going to do this with a uh, transistor, uh, proper biasing is is required. Uh, applications. Where will we see this? This would be in radio transmitters, um, also uh, receivers, <clears throat> frequency, frequency, frequency synthesizers. Um, also in scientific instruments used for uh, providing standards for measurement. And again, I won't go over the, the other ish, the other uh, advantages. It's very simplistic to, to design, um, and it's very stable, and uh, it's got a wide range of applications. <clears throat> All right, crystal oscillators. I mentioned this at the very beginning of part one. Um, crystal oscillator, oscillators, highly stable oscillators for demanding circuits such as radio transmitters, crystals have a very high Q. And some of you might not know what a quartz crystal watch is. That was a big deal when we were younger. It's like, oh, it's got a quartz crystal. Um, so instead of winding it up and using the mechanical um, um, energy that actually caused your watch to, to um, oscillate, right? Go back and forth, and then actually, you know, turn the gears. Uh, newer watches had a battery, had a, uh, a quartz crystal that was cut to to vibrate at a particular frequency, and that's it. It just once it had uh, once it had the proper voltage, it would give you that predetermined uh, precise frequency. Uh, if you don't know what crystals those were, uh, what what are they? Um, Sorry, again, should have prepared before I did this lecture. Quartz, I just said quartz, yeah, quartz. It's a type of material that um, when uh, compressed, it'll actually produce a difference in potential. And then when you apply a difference in potential across it, it actually uh, 
changes its uh, atomic structure and it vibrates. Okay. Yeah, so manufacturers, right, they prepare these natural crystals. Uh, the usually it's quartz. There's other materials besides quartz. Um, they mount a very thin slab of metal electrodes with a small uh, AC voltage, and that causes that, that material to just uh, vibrate at its natural frequency, depending on its structure and size. So those, those are pre-designed. So when you look at the, hold on, uh, the slide, I'm still working on the slide. Crystals act as a resonant circuit for the modified culprits oscillator and stabilizes the oscillations. Capacitors still tap off a feedback signal to the CE amplifier. So right here, we're looking at the, the capacitor network, but instead of the uh, inductor, we're using this, os this uh, crystal quartz here to stabilize the oscillations. Um, and when I said it needs a potential difference across its plates, well, these two capacitors are acting as storage to uh, apply that potential across this crystal here. And so what happens is um, there's a mechanical resonance of the crystal itself. Um, it's a it's a piezo, I'd say piezoelectric material uh, that generates a very, very precise uh, electric signal at, at very specific frequencies. So uh, whatever that crystal is cut for, it's what it's gonna operate at. So with a very particular voltage, it's gonna, op it's gonna vibrate at a certain frequency. Um, if at a very specific uh, compression or physical agitation to the crystal, it's gonna generate some voltage. <clears throat> uh, do, 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 do. They're very good because they even have higher accuracy. They're more stable. They have uh, a low low phase noise, uh, and they're very good for timing timing circuits. What else? What else? I won't go over everything I did in the previous ones, but again, the component is an actual piece of rock. It's a piece of crystal. Uh, look up piezoelectric crystals if you if you haven't looked at those yet. And then the frequency and its properties are determined by its cut. Um, that should be it. They are temperature sensitive. So uh, a challenge with these crystals is that they're very sensitive to temperature. Um, so that's going to affect the resonant frequency of, of the crystal. So in order to mitigate this, um, you you can design these in what they call oven controlled crystal oscillator oscillator packages so that they're less sensitive to temperature uh, variations in the environment wherever they're going to be applied so um, it helps stabilize the, the crystals operating characteristics where are they used i already mentioned that they are used for watches old watches um, You'll, they're on motherboards. You'll see them on motherboards. Uh, um, you'll see them, um, so on motherboards, also microprocessor use, use them, microcontrollers use them. Um, they're very stable, very steady, and you need a very stable clock for those kinds of applications, especially when you're talking about like digital applications. Uh, that's about it for that one. Let's see, next slide. All right, relaxation oscillators. I'm still recording. Cool. Um, this is a type of oscillator that generates non-sinusoidal waveforms. Uh, typically, you're going to get a square wave out of this. You can get triangle. You can get sawtooth waves. Remember, this triangle is just what the uh, rise in and the and the decline is is uh, the same rise in, not run. The the ramp and the ramp down are. are uh, at the same rate, uh, sawtooth it's it's different. One is higher, higher rate than than the uh, other. So the ramp up is like maybe at a higher rate than the, than the uh, ramp down. Um, and again, this is caused by discharging and charging of capacitors, just what we saw in in uh, when we discussed uh, capacitor charge discharge. 
but uh, unlike the other oscillators that rely on some kind of resonant circuit or feedback loop relaxation oscillators they use the principle of, of the relaxation process to produce oscillations and so let's see if we can discuss how they work in the next slides okay so here it says on the slide the triangle wave oscillator is an example for this circuit the device that changes states is a comparator with hysteresis you don't have to know what all that is right now also called a schmidt trigger the rc timing device is an integrator the comparator output can be used as a square wave output so the square wave can be taken uh, right here so uh, the principle of the relaxation oscillator uh, you got a periodic charging discharging of the capacitor uh, of the storage element and this charging and discharging process charging and discharging process um, this occurs in a nonlinear manner versus the linear manner that we had looked at before right so this nonlinear manner leads to the generation of these specific types of oscillations um, now we mentioned feedback so oscillator circuits they do include a feedback mechanism that controls the charging and discharging of the capacitor I keep saying that too quickly the, the charging and the discharging of the capacitor um, so it typically involves a voltage dependent resistor or some switching device like a transistor or a compa uh, comparator there is a threshold voltage you have to consider so the key to uh, relaxation oscillation uh, it sounds pretty comfortable relaxation oscillation uh, the key to it is the presence of this threshold uh, or this switching point where that feedback mechanism triggers a change in the state of the capacitors so when the voltage uh, across the capacitor reaches that certain threshold that feedback mechanism switches and that causes the capacitor to discharge and then once the voltage decreases below uh, another threshold that feedback mechanism again switches and then it causes the capacitor to charge and this cycle just repeats itself it goes back and forth back and forth so it's it's periodic in other words um, the generation of the waveform itself um, again that depends on the specific circuit configuration and the characteristics of the energy storage element so uh, all you need to know for right now is that the common waveforms are going to be square waves triangle waves and sawtooth waves sawtooth waves all right frequency control so um when we're talking about relaxation oscillators that does sound comfortable uh, the frequency control is determined by the time constants that are associated with the charging and discharging of the capacitor and again the characteristics of the feedback mechanism so you can adjust those values of the resistors and capacitors and that's going to give you um, the desired frequency for oscillation or the desired frequency you want we'll cover the formulas uh, in a little bit uh, applications for relaxation oscillation oh hmm I don't know that's better lighting my lights go off mm, that's not better lighting that's fine um, relaxation applications uh, they're good for uh, voltage controlled oscillators VCOs timing circuits VCOs yeah that's in your homework um, modulation circuits they're useful where you have non sinusoidal waveforms where they're required uh, they're, as you can see they're very uh, simple and that actually helps with the the cost because they're easy they're simple they're small to design so they don't cost very much that's that's what I wanted to say with that that's all I got to say so let's look at this example for the triangular wave generator the frequency is found from the formula FR is equal to 1 over 4 R1 times C um, all times r2 divided by r3 so we're given the formula there for the frequency what is the frequency of the circuit shown below 
we all, all we have to do is extract the data from the circuit, extract R1, C, R2, and R3, which are given here on the, on the circuit. We have a comparator in the front, integrator in the, in the back. I tried to click too much, but last time I went too many slides forward. All right, so plug and chug, uh, plug in our numbers. I want you all to do the same thing on your calculator. Make sure that you're getting these numbers. And we end up with a frequency of 671 hertz for a triangle wave generator. So we're going to produce a triangle wave at 671 hertz. All right. So this triangle wave generator, uh, again, it's just a type of oscillated in circuit, produces a waveform with a triangular shape. The waveform uh, will alternate linearly between uh, the, the two voltage levels, uh, the rising falling at that constant rate, like I mentioned, the ramp in the negative ramp. Um, where are triangle wave generators commonly used? Audio signals, uh, frequency modulation, waveform synthesis. Waveform synthesis, uh, we've mentioned quite a bit. We've mentioned for every, every um, oscillating circuit. Okay. And this we go. Sorry. Um, we get a square wave out of the output two and then triangle out of output one. Okay. So we can use this for integration and amplification. Integration is a mathematical function, so we can use this circuit as an integrator. If You'll learn about that in, in, um, in your calculus course. So that's the core of a, a triangle wave generator. It's an integrator, and it's followed by an amplifier. So it, it integrates the input waveform, which is typically going to be a square wave um, or some constant voltage. And it's going to produce an output that is uh, a linear voltage ramp, a representation of that um, either square wave or DC output. Uh, the feedback loop for integrators, so this is fed back to the input as, as usual, and uh, the feedback loop controls the rate at which that integrated charges and discharges. So this ensures that the output waveform has that triangular shape. Um, the op amps, we know what those are for already. They're used to compensate for losses. And when we discuss charging and discharging in this particular uh, circuit, uh, during the charging phase, the integrator, the capacitor charges linearly, and that causes the output voltage to rise linearly. And then during the discharge phase, the capacitor discharges linearly, which causes the output voltage to fall linearly. And so the feedback loop just ensures that the charging discharging rates are symmetrical. And so I think that was the word I was looking for before, symmetrical um, with the charging and discharging. Of, of the triangle wave, the waveform. Frequency control, I won't talk about that. We know that it's, again, based on the uh, RC values. Interesting with this uh, triangle wave generator, um, some implementations, uh, you can have a buffer amplifier uh, that can be added to it or added to the output of the triangle wave. And we use that just to isolate the generator from the load, and that just ensures a, a stable output. So this one doesn't have a buffer uh, on the diagram, but you can put a buffer at the end of it. All right. And then, as usual, uh, one of the the book mentions the uh, advantages of this being very simple in design. Very simple always means low cost. Well, not doesn't always, but uh, usually means low cost. Right. And it usually means uh, good stability. All right. A sawtooth VCO, the difference between a sawtooth and a triangle, right? So we're not talking about triangle waves anymore. Sawtooth, think of it as like, like a tooth. Think of it like a, a shark fin. I think I mentioned it before. A shark fin uh, waveform, which does not look like a triangle. So a sawtooth voltage controlled oscillator, it uses an integrator to create the ramp portion of the waveform. And it says in this case, when VC is greater than VG plus 0.7 for that biasing voltage, uh, the uh, PUT fires and the capacitor discharges rapidly. 
So it says here in the circuit, the device that changes uh, state is a PUT and the RC timing circuit is an integrator. And we find the frequency of this particular circuit uh, by dividing the input voltage times one over R1 times C, all times one over the um, the positive voltage over the uh, final voltage. Feedback voltage, excuse me, not final voltage, feedback voltage. Um, yeah, give me one second. Okay, let's go ahead and continue with another relaxation oscillator. This one uses a Schmidt trigger and this one uh, just uh, creates the basic square wave. <clears throat> it says it has trigger points that are set by R2 and R3. Um, so R2 and R3, that's voltage divided here in the feedback network for the amplifier. And it says the capacitor charges and discharges between the levels that are um, um, defined by the formulas here. I'll leave that there for a second. All right, and then the period of the waveform is given by T is equal to 2 R1C, natural log of 1 plus 2 R3 over R2. <clears throat> so we're not deriving anything in this lecture, but uh, there's a lot of formulas and a lot of different oscillator circuits that we've covered so far. And these are going to become important when you get into things like digital. All right. Now let's end this lecture with the 555 timer. Um, the 555 timer is an integrated circuit or integrated chip, integrated circuit chip. <clears throat> so meaning that we have this integrated circuit inside this chip and it's probably the most used uh, and versatile uh, timer in electronics. Everyone in electronics knows what a 555 timer is. This is like a block diagram. It's not the physical footprint, but it looks just like any other chip. Uh, it was introduced by a company called Signetics, which is now uh, part of Texas Instruments way back in 72. And it's just used just about everywhere. Anywhere you need timers, you're going to most likely see a 555 timer chip. And it's got a lot of a lot of advantages. Very easy to design with, very extremely reliable, extremely accurate. Um, and yeah, that's good. Accuracy, very precise, uh, very simple to design. And um, it's got a lot of applications. <clears throat> see here, we're looking at the internal structure of the 555. Uh, you'll see two voltage comparators. Um, you'll see a set reset, uh, something called a flip-flop um, input. Um, you'll see a, um, a discharge transistor, some resistive network, and then you'll see the other internal components that um, Again, this is not an exact layout of a 555, but some the, the major components of a 555 timer uh, that gives it its uh, timing functions. The pin configuration. So for the 555, if you don't know what the pin configuration is of a component, uh, just Google it, find the spec sheet, and, and that'll tell you what, what uh, the, each pin is. So, but for this one, pin one is ground, and that's just, you connect that to ground. Pin two will be the trigger. That just controls the timing function. Um, pin three is the output. That provides that output signal of the timer. Uh, pin four is the reset. So whenever you need to reset the, the, the chip and start over. Uh, pin five is a controlled voltage, and that's just used to adjust the threshold trigger level. So you can get to uh, turn on and off at, at different thresholds. Pin six is a, another threshold, and that determines the that determines the upper threshold voltage for the timing. P 
pin seven is a discharge. That's what controls the discharge control, and that connects an external uh, capacitor for timing function. So you can uh, add this capacitor for timing. And then pin eight is the supply voltage, <clears throat> the VCC. You only got a couple of slides here. So this can be run, if you can see the picture here, in what's called a stable mode. I'm going to run over some other modes, but we're going to talk about this one first because it's in the diagram in the textbook. So in what's called an A-stable mode, this 555 timer operates like an oscillator. So it generates continuous waveforms, uh, continuous square wave forms, continuous square wave output waveforms. Hopefully I said that correctly. Um, and then you can determine the frequency in the duty cycle of the output waveform by adjusting external resistors and capacitors uh, that are connected to pins six, seven, and eight. And this is kind of what uh, the biologists had wanted me to do, create controls, because they were actually applying a high voltage to tissue, to not just cells, that were cancerous. And they were, instead of turning the power on and off, they were basically removing the ground. Uh, and they wanted to, I, again, I, I, they didn't tell me, uh, what it was that they were expecting to see, but they just wanted me to remove the ground, which is dangerous. I told them this. Uh, so basically it was a high voltage, like DC, a very little current. So something like, let's imagine it was like a thousand volt DC, you know, something in the microamps current, very, very tiny current. Uh, and what we're doing is, is uh, removing the ground <clears throat> and removing the uh, timing. We're timing the, how often we removed the ground and how often uh, it was on. So we're looking at the duty cycle of the ground instead of the duty cycle of the of the voltage. <clears throat> All right. um, there's another mode for the 555 timer, which is called a monostable mode instead of the A-stable mode. Um, and there's another one called a, a bistable mode. I won't go into those. I think we'll just continue. Uh, applications. Okay, I just got my notes here. Applications, so I know what to cover. Um, you'll find these in oh, timers, obviously, because it's a timer. Pulse generators, oscillators, LED flashers, right? Because you can uh, run these pretty fast. Tone generators. Uh, you can build a basic tone generator with a 555 timer uh, in the lab if you want. Voltage controlled oscillators. Uh, motor controlled circuits will have these. So once you start getting into your uh, um, your embedded microcontrollers classes, you're going to be using a 555 timer to to control a um, a motor. Um, that's not much else to discuss about this. Just wanted to introduce you to the 555 timer. You'll be using it in other classes. Oh, and how do you calculate the frequency and the duty cycle, the on time, off time? Uh, here are the formulas for that. All right, so I'm not gonna cover the definitions from here, it's just a summary uh, of the definitions we've covered. I'm just gonna click through this really quickly. All right, um, and then there's the quiz. I'm gonna click through all those. And I won't click the last slide because the last slide has the answers and I don't wanna do that because of the publisher. And I wanna thank you for your time. This is conclusion of part two for oscillators. Uh, stop recording.